Force retired Dan Adams. I'm a volunteer Air Force Academy liaison officer here in the Rochester area. It's my pleasure today to represent the United States Air Force and my privilege to recognize Jacob Das, admittance to the United States Air Force Academy Preparatory School, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, before I uh, continue, again, I, I'd like to congratulate all of the uh, Fairport High School graduates who are heading off into the military. And, and also, I want to thank uh, Mr. Clark uh, for the opportunity to uh, present this, uh, this admittance to, uh, to Jacob. This uh, admittance is the equivalent of a one-year full-ride scholarship to a top-tier college preparatory school. Next year, Jacob will study math, English, science, and military history while participating in strenuous military training and athletic programs. Upon successful completion of the preparatory school, he will have an opportunity to be appointed to the United States Air Force Academy the following year, my alma mater. If appointed to the academy, he will earn a Bachelor of Science 
Brett um, requested that we have the names, and Brett was able to provide those, so I'll read those off in terms of the, I assume the names requested were for the military graduates. And so we have Nicholas Collier going to the Army, Jacob Knapp, U.S. Air Force Academy Preparatory School, Joseph Conway and Ryan Perkowski to the U.S. Air Force, Cody Ryan and Alex Kettle to the Navy, and Griffin Widrick to the United States Navy. So congratulations to them. It was a great ceremony, unique as everything else has been unique in the end of the school year, but uh, pretty awesome to see. So at this time, we are in terms of the agenda, we are to the part of public comments. This will be the first time we have public comment in this format, and Mr. Bill Wynn has already been admitted to the Zoom room for that purpose. Just to remind everybody, it normally a, as a courtesy, right, and since you're only speaker tonight, Mr. Wynn, it is for you. I know you've heard this, but I'll just repeat it, right? For anything, if there's anything to be critical, that should be addressed privately as specific to individuals. Um, otherwise, we're always grateful to hear from the public. So at this time, Mr. Wynn, we will uh, give the microphone to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I know you have a lot on your agenda, so I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'll be forwarding a copy of this board and daily, so anyone at the post knows what's going on, so it's up to you. Um, you, are, you are familiar with my background from uh, last November, Senator Daniel board meetings, and I also spoke during the public comments segment in regards to the DEC articles about the Reverend Winston, something vulnerable kids and to the city school district and city principals. Meetings were held, uh, emails exchanged, recommendations made, but nothing specific that I'm aware of has developed within the, uh, within the district. And your silence continues to be distinctly deafening and depressing. Then the pandemic crisis things down.
foul weather. I'll be, uh, as in the climate, weather. You may have seen it if you get the time. I'll be forwarding to you, but I wanted to mention one phrase. White silence equals violence. And my own, I'll add, is you have to be intentional and be accountable. So I thank you. Those documents will be forthcoming shortly. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, willing to take them. Otherwise, uh, I think I've covered my time. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Are there are any questions? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the communication um, area of our agenda. We have, first up, uh, retiree recognition. I think that's another program that we're going to share. We will hope for better sound quality on this one.
that time with children in school and seeing people retire is just kind of emotional, but that uh, congratulations to them. Anything I would have put in the president's report for today, you've now seen in video. Um, so I don't know that there's much to add other than congratulations. They were great meetings. You know, the last day of celebration that we all have typically attended in terms of the last day for staff was different just like any other. It included the retirees uh, video that you just saw and a few other words. I love that it was bookend as usual by our fantastic musicians, right? Was it Bill Tiberio, did he write that piece or? No, and then the, you're not gonna hear a song here. Oh, oh, the opening song was that? Bill's uh, Joy. Joy, yeah. right, by Bill Tiberio. And then the closing song was Love, written by Rich Green and sung by Rich Green. So uh, it was great to have those bookends as always and we will miss, of course, Rich and his musical talent. So with, with that, though, I don't have much uh, just to say in terms of to all of our students, to all of our staff, that uh, they have the summer to try and rejuvenate and prepare for uh, another school year, which is likely to start very differently than any others in the past. And 2020 will continue along a different path, and we, we may never be the same, which is great. We, we learn, we grow, and we change. So with that, Brett, I will give it to you for the superintendent's report. longer than I am in the school district, the more opportunities that you have to have very important, powerful relationships. Um, you see so many incredible people doing so many incredible things for our children, for the benefit of our community, and it's really hard each year to say goodbye to our staff. And I know it's see you later. I know many of them have great plans to continue to give back. Um, it's in their hearts and in their souls who, who they are, and it's what we work for and aspire to in, in Fairport to, to build upon the rich legacy and high expectations for each other and for the benefit of our children. So congratulations to our class. Um, usually this meeting, it's a very different meeting. Geez, uh, every year at this time we're sort of wrapping up and we really haven't wrapped up, but I do think it's important that we, we do have some closure and uh, you know, COVID-19 since March, 16th um, it's been a really different end of the school year and I just want to take a moment and just have you pause and just have a moment of silence um, there's there's COVID the health crisis COVID the economic crisis um, COVID the social emotional crisis COVID the social unrest crisis and I just want to take a, a brief moment and, and pause and, 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 and wherever you are and just reflect on these past several weeks Thank you. It's definitely been a different journey, and uh, you know you can never say thank you enough. Whether it's to our caring community, to our incredible staff, to our administrative team, to our board of education, who spends countless hours um, trying to understand and be the best for our community, um, you know the, the, our food service program, who you know who's beckoning upon 55,000 plus meals, who we've been able to feed to our our community in need um, you know, to our transportation center who's helped transport those items the appreciation and gratitude is is really heart heartfelt and, and expansive to the technology team who's always on the job working out the kinks trying to you know grow through this process with us um, we will perfect it um, as, as we move along I'm confident uh, I'm grateful for everyone and for all that you have given to our school year, especially the final last few weeks. I have to say that, you know, Mr. Wynn, we really appreciate your comments. We appreciate you know, the insights that you continually offer. This was um, part of a response that I gave early in June. I think it was around June 5th that I shared reflections on what was happening in the world around us in response to the issues, the social unrest, and the, the um, death of George Floyd. This was a statement that I wrote 
and it speaks to the fact, you know, of our expectations as a school district, as a community, there's really not a lot of pivoting that we need to do. Our Board of Education, I'm looking forward to hearing them talk about their statement, really has high expectations on how we move forward. We m have been meeting with students. We will continue to meet with students. We've had several opportunities to interact with our middle school and our high school students in restorative conversations. We had staff members interact with students as well. I know coaches were reaching out to their student athletes um, just to have this very important dialogue and conversation. Um, we need to do more though. And I remember the night of you know the unrest, it was the weekend in Rochester when there was unrest in downtown city streets where I was just um, really sad and, and distraught. Um, texting friends of mine, friends of mine that were African Americans and you know, words are not enough. We need action now. We need to step in and we need to make sure that we use our positions to make the world a better place, to be anti-racist. Um, these threads, um, this conversation is much, much too overdue, right? It's been over 400 years, over 150 years since the Civil War. Um, we've gone through uh, slavery to segregation um, to apartheid to systematic racism, um, all part of our history. And, and we've been doing, and we will continue to review our practices and our policies to create systematic change. We need to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable, not just talking about it like Mr. Wynn was saying. And we're poised to do that. We're bolstering our if efforts in curriculum, um, making sure that every single student has an opportunity to understand um, the historical roots of racism, to understand the history of African Americans and the impact of minorities uh, or those who have been through our system and who have been unrepresented in America and how we need to do a better, better job of understanding them and then using our positions to support them so as a world community we can grow together. But it starts with our curriculum. It also starts with our hiring practices and I know that we've had um, opportunities to look at our hiring practices and we will be talking more about ways that we're recruiting and we're hiring a diverse workforce. We need to continue to build those networks and it, the policies and the practices um, that occur with our code of conduct, other policies that we have. I know the board takes that responsibility very seriously. But as I was writing this, I wrote this first, I was very proud to say that our superintendents from Monroe County wrote this letter. And this letter right here, And this letter right here is from all of the superintendents in Monroe County. And it speaks to assessing policies and practices. It speaks to building capacity throughout the, each organization, joining a regional network, all endeavors, imperatives that we will, are and will and continue to be a part of. We are gonna partner with Monroe County colleagues to again, look at curriculum because we know that kids receive curriculum. It's our one opportunity to make sure that all students are hearing and understanding and being um, well versed into um, the, the journey of our um, African American brothers and sisters. Um, we need to make sure that we listen and respond to the voices of our students and families of color. Again, in Fairport, we have the Diversity Council. Appreciate your, um, your, um, your suggestion about anti-racist council. Mr. Wynn. Um, we also have the Lead by Example group. Again, opportunities to hear the voice of our families. We continue to try to write, again, curriculum in Fairport. K-5, there'll be curriculum, curriculum writing occurring um, using literature. Same thing that's happening 6-8 and 9-12 this summer. And we'll be looking forward to reporting on that. And, and I know the board has those expectations as well. But this is something I'm very proud of because this isn't just, you know, Fairport grappling with this. We're going to try to grapple with this together as a community. We need to get better. We need to have action. We need to step in. And as a, as a community, we're poised to do it. As a Fairport community, we're wired to do this. Um, 
and I know that we're tied into state networks as well um, as we grow through this journey together. And I know the board will be talking about their statement in a little bit as well. I'd like to say thank you to our Fairport residents for um, passing our school budget with a 69% approval rating. We had over 8,000 votes that had to be processed. Um, at the end of the day, um, there's the yes and no votes. Uh, it equated to 69% approval rating. Um, we have an 81% approval for our capital project tech reserve. Again, that's building upon our technology initiative tied to our strategic initiatives and planning as we move forward. I would like to congratulate Board of Education members Erica Bellos, um, Bellos Pacer and Marty Cardona and Joyce Conda, um, Joyce Kostick, excuse me, um, who will be part of the Board of Education serving the mission of um, and continue to build upon the mission that we started here in um, my tenure the past five years. So I'm honored to be working with um, Erica and Marty and Joyce um, as we move forward. If I might, just at this point, because of that recognition, to also say thank you to Kevin Glover. I believe this is your last official board meeting tonight, and thank you for your years of service. It's been a pleasure serving with you, Kevin, so we wish you all the best, and we appreciate you still being with us here to the end. Sorry, Kevin, not sure how that came up. <laughs> is that what you're moving on to? Bigger, better Congress is your next step? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Mr. Forrest Green, for bringing that very important recognition. Mr. Glover, you made us all better. We appreciate your insights and, and definitely deep commitment to the imperative of the Board of Education. As we talk about our eventual return, Facebook Live will be live tomorrow. That's June 24th at 7 p.m. We'll be here. There'll be a panel of experts um, from the community and from our internal organization to talk about our internal, or excuse me, our eventual return back to school. Um, the PTA is sponsoring this and we are gonna be interacting with our community to discuss the social emotional well-being of our students and staff and the health implications of COVID and the recommended best practices to consider. Again, that's tomorrow night, Facebook Live, 7 p.m. We are so proud of our graduates. We're grateful for the impressions that they've made on our school community. Two weeks ago, 480 graduates have went through Fairport High School with their families, captured some very important moments together. And um, we celebrate and honor who they are, what they've done and how they've grown in our school system. We will continue to recognize them this Thursday. There will be a parade at Fairport High School. And we are also hoping that in the very near future, we're gonna learn about the ability to bring this class together in an outside venue as part of a greater celebration. But we still have more work to do around that. So please stay tuned. But we're proud of our graduates. We appreciate the resilience and the fortitude that they have shown throughout this closure. It's been a different year. It's affected their families and their rites of passages that they thought that they were going to be able to experience. But nonetheless, their time in Fairport has been meaningful. They are forever etched in our hearts. We love our class of 2020. And with that, I, that completes my report. Thank you. Thank you. A lot to celebrate tonight and congratulations all around. Um, thank you for a great report and and direct conversation that we're going to have to continue to have in terms of being anti-racist in, in the district, in the community, in the country as a whole. 
I, I'm glad it's taken on that level of um, what's the word importance, gravity at, at the at the national level, but here in our own community, um, we that takes us to on the agenda the treasure and investment update, Mr. Matt Stevens. Matt, we'll give you the microphone. Okay, thank you and good evening. Uh, tonight we have the treasurer's investment update for April 2020. We had a beginning general fund balance of 75 million, receipts during the month of 2.3 million, disbursements of 9 million for an ending cash balance of 68.3 million. Of the 68.3, about 55.6 is invested in a mixture of treasury bills, uh, insured cash sweep account and CDs, which is approximately 81% of the general fund cash balance. You'll notice in this one, we would talk about interest earnings, a good bulk of interest was received during the month of April. Um, of approximately $333,000 as a whole. So right on track, similar to prior year, um, as a whole, as we near year end. Thank you. Thank you. If I shed tears, it's because I know that interest line won't be the same next year. <laughs> um, as well as many other things, and we'll lose that as a revenue source for us um, in these hard times. But thank you. Uh, any questions about that before we go on to the consent calendar? No. Okay, so for the consent calendar, and you need a motion to uh, accept or adopt or approve the consent calendar as outlined items A through F. Do I have a motion? Joyce, thank you. Judy, second. Um, all right. Habit. Can't ask for any questions or comments. So all in favor, take a vote. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing and hearing none. 7 0. Nobody's dropped off, right? We're still good? Okay. <laughs> um, can't. Personnel action items. We have a couple memorandums of agreement. So, for the first memorandum of agreement the, between the district and the FEA, um, need a motion to approve this MOA. Move, Tim. Tim, thank you. Second? Thank you, Marty. Marty, thank you, Marty. Second. Uh, comments or questions about this? I, oh, oh, go ahead, it, Brett, or Damon. Briefly. It can hardly hear you, Damon. Can you? Can you hear me now? Yes, it, it's hard. Right. I didn't. Um, I didn't quite understand the context of this MOA. If you could just describe that real quickly, that'd be helpful for me. Yeah, this, just because of the COVID nineteen world that we were living in, the the we had to make an adjustment to how we um, executed internal transfers, the process, how we executed the process. So um, I usually believe that it's a, oh, she's got a microphone. Sorry, yeah. thank you. Yep. Yep, you are. Try that again, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this M MOA really is a modification of what's in the FEA contract for internal transfers for any new positions that are available within the district for teachers. It's a 10-day transfer window in the contract. But with everything we had going on with COVID and uh, reductions and trying to make the, the moves and things we needed to do to fill positions in a timely manner, the FEA agreed to reduce that window from 10 days to five days. Uh, so that that allows us to consider any internal transfers really in half the time that we normally would so that we could either move those folks uh, per their request or then go to uh, the preferred eligibility list or to external candidates. It just really shortens the time frame for that process. It was very helpful because we had so much going on during this period of remote work and everything there. Okay, all right, makes sense then. Thank you. You're welcome. No other questions? Take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed?
Seeing, hearing none, 7 0. The second memorandum of agreement, this is for recognition of a retirement that came in past deadline, but uh, accepting that with the change. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Marty, second. second. Joyce. Um, questions about this one? No, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing and hearing none, 7 0. And then our instructional action items, which happen in the memorandum, MOA happened in that order partially because on this list is uh, the retirement itself, right, which we're accepting. So we um, need a motion to approve this instructional staff actions. So moved. Is that Kevin? Second, Tim. Second, Tim. Questions or other comments? Very good. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, 7 0. Non instructional action items. I'll make the motion. So, Peter, the motion to approve. I need a second. 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 Okay, Marty, second. We all, we all wait to do it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> that's the technology age. Um, second, Marty, though. And any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Hearing or seeing none, 7 0. And finally, approval of increase of salaries for personnel who aren't covered by our various collective bargaining agreements. We need a motion to approve that. So, so moved. Okay, I see Joyce's hand. Tim, will you be a second? Yes? That was Damon, I believe. Oh, Damon. Damon, second. Okay, I'll second Joyce. It. <laughs> Quit fighting over it. Kevin Joyce is first for sure. We'll call Damon second, I guess, or Kevin second. Taylor, you get the pick. And <laughs> all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing, seeing none, 7 0. So this takes us to our, we have a couple presentations. The first one, uh, annually we look at, reviewed, and revisions are submitted to us as a board, the Code of Conduct. And we have in our presence here, Ms. Deb Miles, to help present that to us, yes? And we're, we're also gonna bring uh, Becky Short oh, to sorry, um, Becky. the table. She was part of the process in the group that helped um, with some of these changes. So wh what we're gonna do is, oh, you guys are gonna stay back there? Uh, wherever you wanna go. We were gonna have these two gentlemen move and you guys come forward, right? You see where we rank. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> And I will help drive this. So I'll, I'll do whatever you want. You should. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're here obviously to talk about the revisions to the Code of Conduct. Um, and so we went through, um, I sent you obviously the document so you can see the revisions that we are suggesting. And we went through and just did a kind of a cursory review. This gets updated every year, of course. So um, we really um, wanted to just make sure we hit the high points uh, during COVID and um, and then, of course, our plan long term will be to come back together as a larger committee in November, I'm thinking, and probably work through May, a little bit longer, extensive review of the code to incorporate language around restorative practices and also um, culturally responsive uh, language as well. So we've been putting a little bit of that stuff in the code over the past um, year or so with some PBIS language as well. but. Um, wanted to make sure that our staff and our administrators are trained in restorative practices before we get too much language and movement in the code of conduct um, you know ahead of that and making sure that people are able to implement appropriately so um, included in the document that was sent to you is the uh, three-year implementation plan for restorative practices we're moving along nicely on that plan there was just a little bit of a hiccup with the closure of school of course um, and so we've had to kind of reshuffle what we're doing with our staff over the summer in terms of training 
but we are bringing together all of our principals and assistant principals for a two-day training in restorative discipline practices, which obviously will, um, you know, link nicely to our code of conduct. And then, um, you know, as we look to move forward for next year, um, ideally we're sitting here a year from now with a very different look um, in regards to our code of conduct and uh, working with Brett to, um, you know, connect with BOCES or some uh, sort of, you know, graphic designer as well in terms of the professionalism of our code as well. So with that said, we'll just review um, some of the areas that we took a look at, and then if you guys have questions, certainly we're happy to answer them. So I just want to integrate the fact, I, I, first of all, I appreciate the, the process that we will be going into starting in November, but, you know, we do have bodies, um, school-based, district-based bodies, the Diversity Council, you know, they'll have their eyes on this as well to put it through that lens. I know that that's, you know, something that is important to not only the board, but to our school community as a whole. So please know that this will be a thorough, more comprehensive review. COVID definitely, you know, got us off track a little bit with our timeline, uh, and I look forward to engaging in that process. But again, action, what are we, what are we doing? What systems are we putting in place to um, address our policies and making sure that we're being responsive culturally to our whole entire school community. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so just the very first off, um, and we're kind of seeking input from you as well regarding this piece, um, being that we're unsure of what school will look like in September and what some of the recommendations will be, we um, added a statement regarding um, COVID-19 and recommendations from the Monroe County Department of Health, the Centers for D Disease Control, as well as New York State Department of Education. Um, so you can see that that statement is there, um, just indicating really that they provided guidelines that the school district will adhere to in an effort to provide a safe environment for students and staff. So that was just something we thought maybe would um, I don't know, just add a little bolster. legs or bolster the code of conduct just in terms of if we get a lot of resistance to, um, you know, social distancing and following the protocols and practices that we put in place for September for the safety of students. So that can, you know, it can stay. Or if you have recommendations for how we might word it differently, or if you don't think that it belongs there at all, as, as I said, we're open to your feedback on that piece. Um, in terms of the broader topics, we took a quick look at uh, transportation, the use of electronic devices, the student dress code, and student searches and interviews. So uh, just, just a tiny little tweak with the transportation piece in that um, we have uh, just added the one piece about throwing objects from the bus. That seems to be something that comes up, um, yet it's not documented in the Code of Conduct. So I think just a little explicit language about uh, the safety of keeping items within the bus. Um, I'm gonna have Becky speak to the um, section on student use of electronic communication devices. We did some extensive review with that. Um, and we were prompted to do that um, Okay. We were, yeah, we were prompted to do that just in terms of the fact that obviously we've just spent three months out on virtual learning. Um, that could also be a part of our world this next school year. So we just wanted to make sure our code of conduct addressed some of those expectations. Thanks. Um, our recommendation first and foremost was to change the name to digital citizenship and acceptable technology use. Um, just indicating that students have a responsibility when they have the technology, but also that we're educating them as to how to use the technology. Um, we did um, make some changes in the K-8 portion, um, indicating that they are prohibited from school unless, um, unless it's an, for an acceptable academic use, and we defined what that acceptable academic use would be. Um, there is a, a bit of a, a change developmentally between K-8 and 9-12, and that had previously been there. Instead of um, indicating that it's personal technology going down, um, we notice that um, in the future, students may be bringing home um, our district devices, so we um, recommend making that more general of a phrase. If you look um, further down in that paragraph, 
we removed a lot of the dated technology and um, provided some more general statements around the types of technology that are current and could be um, seen in the near future. We, um, on the students are not permitted to use any form of information technology. We really um, wanted to make sure that we were very explicit in the type of things that were permitted or not permitted to be shared. Um, making sure that um, our students are being um, kind, not humiliating others, not harassing others. We wanted to make sure that we were very specific in the types of things that, um, that we have seen in school and wanted to make sure that that was indicated there. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the initial segment of this, of this, of this section um, talks about acceptable, other prohibited children are pro prohibited from using uh, cell phone technology or digital technology in the schools except expressly permitted by the administration. Um, and I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a bold statement of the code of conduct. Um, and I just want to make sure that we've got policy and regulation that backs that up, right? Both in K through 12 and in higher ed, because, you know, this code of conduct says it's pretty explicit that students are prohibited from using or having in an operational mode any cell phone technology during instruction time, which I think is um, something that we've grappled with as a board in terms of making a consistent policy across the district. And it's pretty clear in the code of conduct that it's consistent, but I'm not sure that our policies and regulations are. We will have to update our policies for a few things here. And thank you for doing what you've done with the technology and getting rid of our, those old type devices from there. We'll make our policy match that and then we'll have to review our policy as to what we want in it. But I think the current policy does leave it up to administrators. I'm pretty sure that that's what we have said. It's, we left it, the board has left it to administration to make those it's decisions. Still written, so. It's still written that way. I don't, I'm sorry, Joyce, I apologize. It's still written that way, so Deb, um, we want to just take that's them through that. That's what I that. thought. I yeah. think that's how we. Yeah, there is we still flexibility for administrators for, to make that decision. Right, there's still flexibility for administrators. Um, I mean, K five, there really isn't a use of technology at all. Six eight, um, we made some changes to align both middle schools last year, and um, the use of technology in middle schools, personal technology in middle schools, is. Um, left up to the discretion of the teacher if there was an academic activity going on in class and students were allowed to bring it in or left up to the administrator if it was you know an opportunity that they wanted to grant the students you know on good behavior or an occasional opportunity during the lunchroom that type of thing but overall middle school life has been uh, personal technology turned off not interrupting the school day um, or in your locker for a myriad of reasons I had a couple of questions as well. Um, to, since we have been sending devices home and may very well have to do it again, to say that they can only use uh, district devices for educational and research and that sort of thing, is it really realistic at home for them to not, to, for us to think that they aren't going to use that device to go onto Facebook or to chat with a friend so, or so other that's our ex, so that's our expectation with it. And if students do deviate, um, if they do get themselves on sites, it's important that since it is district property, that we are able to monitor that and understand, and then inform and communicate with parents. Um, so I, I think that that's a that's a strong um, expectation that that actually. It protects our students. It protects. It, it helps us inform and collaborate with parents. Um, that doesn't mean you know there won't be a child out there on a personal computer doing you know working on a Google Doc. But that you know that you know those will be right. Well, we certainly. I mean, we do police a little bit what happens on our technology. Um, so even when students were on virtual learning the past three months, our administrators were notified. You know, through our instructional support center, when students were you know, entering into uh, websites or, you know, 
Google searching things that they shouldn't have been searching. Um, they get that kind of um, notification through email and then they were promptly contacting parents and having a very good conversation with parents and students about what the acceptable use of uh, you know, school technology is during our school closure. So I think it's there to guide students in the right way. We will be supplementing that also with PBIS lessons that are being written this summer on um, appropriate uh, virtual learning behavior um, and expectations when you're in a Google Meet as a classroom. The same expectations that you would have if you're physically in a classroom apply also to a virtual classroom. So we'll be explicitly reviewing that with our students proactively if we should be out on a school closure again. Well, I didn't mean, uh, certainly I expect that they're gonna be monitored and that certainly there'll be something done if they go to something inappropriate, but there are lots of appropriate things that may not have to do with their education or their research. And if it's in their home, it just seems unrealistic. I mean, I've seen it myself just visiting classes when students were supposed to be doing something. And I remember there was a little fourth grade boy who was on the ESPN site checking scores and reading things. And that was me. You know, that's not a bad use of a device, but to say that it has to be educational or research pur purposes only, if it's in their home, it seems like there should be some leeway there as opposed to saying only. It just seems unrealistic to me. So we'll, we'll, look so we'll at, take a look at it. We'll right. look at that language. But the, the thing about it is if you put like constructive, my constructive is different than your constructive. So, but I do like what you're saying about let's measure our words and let's see if we can look at the word and, and make it a little bit more um, transferable or translatable. So I, I think you're right. We sort of lock ourselves in. So thank you, Joyce. Yeah, and Brent, I'll just say from, from I had kids that, you know, didn't go to Fairport that had devices, Chromebooks from school, and, um, you know, they use those. I will say they, you know, they went to Amazon or they shopped or they went to Facebook using it. I mean, there's, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we quantify it in, in a code of conduct like this, but I mean, obviously that's, that's not necessarily a problem versus other sites that are clearly, um, are clearly problems, right? And how we define that. If we want to define that, is, is tricky. But again, my you know, I'll just say my daughter wasn't necessarily a, doing anything wrong. But kids are going to go on like social media sites if they have an electronic mechanism to do so. Yeah. To, to which to which we have to also be careful because if we are supplying as a district those devices, um, taxpayer money is going to pay for those, so it should be used for the purpose of education, not for their personal. If that's the case, because then you get into that sticky wicket. Yep. Yeah where you've got public money being spent for personal use or personal gain and that's correct clearly where where lines get get muddy well as i say it happens in the classroom as well you know it's, true. Mean, it's just to make it so so firm as to use the words only so it just doesn't seem realistic that's great feedback and again that's why you know we do have a time period after this where we'll continue to you know, take suggestions like this and um, you'll see it in its, in its evolving format. I'm also just curious, um, it says to obey copyright laws and several things in there. Do students, I mean, like high school, maybe middle school, learn anything about copyright laws? Because I remember a few years ago when some of us attended <laughs> something at Harris Beach and they talked to us about copyright laws. <laughs> There were, there were an awful lot of gasps in that room that we all knew we were not following copyright laws. Joyce, when I, when I was teaching, we I would always do a, a research project. And the first thing we did is spend at least three or four days just understanding what citation is and why do we cite other people's work. Uh, it was, it's a, uh, all, the librarian has a complete program and she spent three days going over what is copyright, what do you, how do you cite someone's work, why do you cite someone's work. And, you know, the, and, and she brings up some cases of students who were kicked out of college because of this. And, and the kids are like, really? Yeah. And it's spiraled, so, so it's spiraled do, throughout. I, I personally did that. And the kids I worked with, we did that. It's spiraled throughout the curriculum. And I know, you know, my Sammy, who's been going through it, you know, has, he, he knows how to annotate. Um, you know, and then as you move through, it gets more um, elaborate and you learn different styles and methods, as Mr. Sliz was just saying. 
And, and Joyce, it's it's nice because now they have a program. So you just type in the information and it puts the commas and the colons and the semicolons where, where we'd get points off in college if it wasn't there. Well, I just, I remember one of the things that I learned from that was you can send a, you can post a link to an article, but you can't copy the article and send a person the article. It's infringing on copyright if you send the article, but if you send the link, you're fine. And they gave us many things that all of us were saying, oh my goodness, I've done that, I've done that. And so I was just curious, but it's good to know that it is brought up and librarians talk about it and whatever. I just didn't know, thank you. What page we Yep, so um, we are going down to the electronic devices. So uh, the Fairport Central School electronic devices. Um, we pulled a lot of this language from the um, acceptable, acceptable use policy and um, many of these bullets come directly from that and they were lifted from that. So this is something that we have the, the students and their parents uh, review and sign prior to each school year. So we're making sure that they're seeing it in a couple of different places. Joyce, I think this is maybe where you saw some of the copyright stuff. Um, and again, yeah, this is stuff that is spiraled through the curriculum and um, taught to the students so this isn't something that we just expect of them we do um, teach them so that they understand what we're, our expectation is and then moving down to uh, virtual learning we did put a, um, a statement about virtual learning um, understanding that there might be a time where we need to have students accessing their um, their education remotely we left this slightly vague, but indicated that classroom teachers would have guidelines um, for virtual learning. And in each school, I think we will work to establish what some of those guidelines are for um, each grade level, grade band. So our next section is the student dress code. Um, so we actually altered this quite a bit last year, so it's just one little tweak this year in terms of some wordsmithing, um, just in terms that uh, students and their parents have the responsibility for accessible student dress and appearance. We removed the word primary, um, and then we added with the understanding that the district has the authority to make the decisions on questionable dress in school. And then with, with kind of altering that sentence, we took the last sentence off in that section where it says the principal has the authority to make decisions on questionable dress in school. So we just really kind of combined it right up front just to not be misleading that, um, uh, you know, parents have, the response to, parents have the responsibility, of course, to send their students to school dressed appropriately, but um, there was just some questioning about um, whether that read that that's kind of the final word versus the perception or, um, you know, appearance of students arriving to school and whether that fits the actual dress code. So, so. The, the cultural appro appropriation um, that we sometimes have to manage, for example, during Halloween where students dress, um, you know, I think that was the motivating factors by some of the administrators that I was talking to. It came to, well, this is not offensive to me and my group of friends, right? Um, well, it was offensive to a whole lot of other groups um, and, and, and it became this, you know, who can make that decision at the end of the day. So I think this is a nice way to sort of, again, to make sure that if it is disrupting the educational environment, for example, cultural appropriation, um, where those things will come about, um, this sort of gives uh, some leverage. Well, we actually took care of that last year, and we don't have, and for that very reason, we don't identify any specific type of clothing. So last year, if you recall, we uh, focused yeah. intently on that and took out things like, 
you know, shirts that show midriffs, tube tops. We took out all of those things that led more toward female fashion, if you will. So none of that is in the code of conduct anymore. So you could look at that in a couple of different ways, and there might be students who wear something very outlandish that is not in, um, you know, gender related at all, but just might wear something that is shocking um, and crazy for school, and that would fall under that. I'm trying to find that. Where is that? I'm sorry, I'm working on it. Gotcha. I'm with you. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. So, so Judy, you're feeling uncomfortable with that. You're you're feeling uncomfortable with that sentence, Judy. Is that? I'm just trying to take a look at, like, um, Becky was speaking to the fact of if somebody's wearing clothing that has something offensive on his or her shirt, that becomes disruptive, it distracts. Um, and I know, you know, Judy is speaking to the fact of if it's about dress, you know, and that's what it becomes. So I, I think, you know, the, there's two different intentions that we need to sort of clarify. I, I see it. I see it both ways. I really do. I well, you're right. They're both important, and, though. And I, and I think, I, I think that being said, that some are just about trying to incorporate some of our, our students who come from different uh, religious backgrounds and different and different uh, ethnicities that have different type of dress at, at certain times of the year, so that uh, you know, girls can come to school with their hijab on, uh, boys can come to school with with a certain dress that they have in the formal. So if you put, for uh, example, clothing. A formal event that but we will get away from that on purpose because that does lean toward country. gender. And, and it's, but at the same way, kids could have come from dress to school. Like the clothing that is just yeah. outstanding yeah. and fantastic yeah. and, they're, and they're just beautiful from their own country. And, and this allows us to say, yes, those kids can wear these beautiful pieces of clothing. So let's grapple with it. I don't, you know, I don't think we're, you know, solving it right here. But I think it's, you know, we'll highlight it and we'll, you know, um, weigh it up against, um, you know, some future dialogue. Does that sound reasonable, mm -hmm. Judy? Oh, yeah. sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you for the feedback. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So this next one, not any more uh, <laughs> easier to work through, <laughs> is. Um, the student search and uh, uh, interview section. And um, the piece with this section, I put the little kind of asterisks in there because at the time you were also working on the policy and the administrative regulation. So we felt like we had done work with Harris Beach and with the administrative cabinet this past winter. 
that new policy recommendations then went to you for your readings. So we felt like it was really critical that that policy align with this section in the student code of conduct and make sure that everything was syncing well and consistent. So I did the best that I could in terms of taking your edits that are in progress. Um, I don't think that you have fully locked into those for the third reading, but your edits that are in process um, and trying to put them into the language that is in the code of conduct. So the easy button was the CPS language, of course. You guys had that spelled out quite clearly. It's really what we do anyway, but it was just identifying that and that piece. The other pieces were just a recommendation from part of the committee that instead of using the word police, uh, to use the words law enforcement because it's all encompassing of the different departments that we work with. Um, and then, um, then there's some of the other language in there in terms of like the reasonableness of any search. Um, so that language you'll see in red. That I kind of took from the policy to put into here just to be a little bit more explicit in making sure that students and parents fully understand um, what is appropriate. Um, the piece about uh, searches of a student's person or personal property has been the language in the past. There was some recommendation to say to include the student's vehicle while on school property. Um, and then just using the words authorized staff members. As, um, and then the last part on that uh, third paragraph is the factors to be considered in determining whether reasonable suspicion exists. Again, that was out of the policy. It was cleaned up in the policy. It's a little bit more specific for students and parents to understand, so we, I added that piece. So I'm open to feedback on that section. So this mirrors the policy that's been under review. It was also processed through Harris Beach and our administrative team. And again, I'm really happy, thank you for being mindful that it, it did it did parallel it. I'm just wondering, and, and again, maybe not the second, how does it translate to the policy committee? You know, is it what you thought it would be on paper when we were doing the policy? And I know that that's something that you guys have worked hard on. So that's my question. And you don't need to answer it right now, but as we move through this, this should be something that the policy committee, um, let's bring it to the policy committee. Let's put it number one on the docket because you know, time is of the essence here as we move through this process. So I think we were close to it. I think we were pretty much we were pretty much done with it. It's just a matter of, you know, I, I agree with you, Mr. Sliz, that we should get the policy, overlay it to this to see if it's translating the way that the policy committee had wanted it to translate because I know you spent a lot of time and I think the words are going to mirror it and it mirrors the Harris Beach guidance. I just want the board to feel comfortable and when we have a policy meeting this should be the first bit of business I would recommend so we can understand how they're, to, how they're weighing up and we can give the feedback so we can move and have this part of the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Make sense? So I think Taylor is out there and I know she'll make this a priority at our next board policy meeting and we'll get that information directly back to the team here and uh, if there's language or word choice, by all means, I think they'll be open to that. Again, what you do in policy sometimes when you see it on paper, you just want to make sure that, like for what Judy was saying, the language, the word choice, um, you know, gender neutral, all that stuff, let's make sure that it applies. Okay. So I would say that after tonight's presentation of the Code of Conduct, we will post it on the website for a 30-day open comment period. The board would then hold a public hearing for the code of conduct, just like we've done in the past. 
and this team wouldn't have to come and redo this except for any type of changes that we make along the way, right? And that's when we will report on those changes. We've already made a couple changes and we'll reflect those changes in our next conversation, but it's important that we follow the timeline for the open um, public open comment period. Um, we'll have very clear directions on our website. If people wanna make comments or provide feedback, um, if they wanna come to an open session and have that opportunity, they will have that as well. Um, but we'll post that and I appreciate the work and uh, you know, trying to grab all the different stakeholders together in, in the middle of all this too. I, and I'm looking forward to November when we can take this to a new level as well. But it'd be it'd be like the health and safe health safety and welfare. There needs it, it needs it needs to be couched with with a health um, safety. You know, it needs to be about that. I yeah, the welfare. Yeah, we can work on the word choice there, and um, that will be part of the process. And that is, I mean, just for the record, that's current language. That's not new language. So, mm -hmm. but that does come down to the suspicion of a gun or a knife or something. Yes, that would jeopardize the safety of the of the building. And that could be, the, and, and again, that could be couched with the right language. So, good feedback. So, right. thank you. Yep. Yep. And you'll circle yep, we'll back. Take three. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. team, for coming. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. statement statement on racism okay next uh, presentation wise I derelict in duty a little bit I meant to reach out to see if anybody wanted to volunteer to read this um, it's, it's a presentation not adopting or doing anything in terms of making it a resolution are there any volunteers? I'm happy to do it myself if nobody does, but uh, uh, I, I, I yeah. Tim, that would be great. Can you hear me all? Yes. Yep. Let's just, just so the audience knows, we've gotten some questions uh, over the course of many days. And it was written a couple of weeks ago. And since this was written, there have been some other unfortunate situations in our society that could be added to this. But I will read what we wrote back.
does, right? I think I, I don't want to speak necessarily for everybody, but in terms of the participation during this writing, um, felt that that was the case. That, um, we stand behind this as a as a group and individually. So thank you, Tim, for reading that, um, and we'll continue to get it out there. We've asked that it be, what's the word, disseminated through all the various ways of communication that exist today and be posted under the Board of Ed as well on our website. Um, that takes us to part eight of our agenda. We have donations that we need to approve or accept the approval of these donations and with our gratitude as well to those who have made the donations. So a motion to approve or accept, whichever it is. Uh, Joyce, I saw your hand first. Tim, will you be second? Okay, and uh, any comments or questions other than to say thank you? Some generous here, the baseball field, right, uh, fencing and scholarship grant is fantastic. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Hate to ask, but any opposed? Okay, hearing, seeing none, 7-0. Um, we do have some second readings of policy, or one policy in this case. A motion to approve the second reading of policy 5741. Marty, thank you. Second, Judy. Second, Judy. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, 7 0. Um, did we do these separate on purpose? Approval of the second reading for 6562. Normally we can just do this in one. I apologize, I didn't notice that. All right, join them together. But anyway, this next policy, 6562. Motion to approve. Tim, second, Judy. Questions or comments about that? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing, seeing none, 7 0. Annually, we approve the rental agreement between the district and FEA. You have the agreement attached for your reference. Need a motion. I'll make the motion to approve that. Do you need a second? Second. Lots of volunteers. Joyce, I saw your hand first. <laughs> uh, questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing, seeing none. 7 0. Approval. A lot of approvals here, but this is the time of year when we start doing that in preparation for next year. So our athletic training services agreement, again, there for your reference, a motion to approve. Technically, we should get the motion and then, then the question asked. Right. Okay, so we have the first and second, Joyce and Tim, and now Judy, ask away. So um, I do know that you know, they, they will, uh, and I can get a very explicit definition for you, because I, I have asked that very question before, and, and it was, as I recall, based upon you know, the need and the frequency and the availability and the partnering with the neighboring district. Again, if we go to Churchville, the Churchville trainer's there, right? And they'll be there to support even medical doctors as well, because um, we can't send this person to does become like they're on site and they're on the cart and you'll see them going from the JV field to the varsity field all the way you know down to a practice you know you know behind the playing field so um, it's definitely a thin, a thin resource. Is, is there a I could find that out. I, I could I could find out you know 
how it's weighted, you know, where this person is, and how they go about and assign those um, particular individuals. I can give you a specific great question and I'll get a formal answer because you know to the soccer player who is injured you know it's the number one most important thing that we need to do is make sure that there's medical attention there so I, I like that to get a very formal answer I do think that there is for lack of the right word an algorithm to what they try to do so there's always coverage and there's opportunities for medical support if it's not our own person I mean, obviously, there are some yeah, sports like, like golf. Like golf doesn't need a trainer, usually because the the opportunities of injury in a golf game is is very low. Right, but we don't have them at basketball games, and even our home basketball games. And it would seem like I know home our basketball has a high incidence of concussions. And one of the things with concussions is they're much more likely to be diagnosed if you have a medical trainer um, at a game than if you don't. And so it just seems like something that we might want to prioritize. So I, I, um, I, I, agree. I love this conversation. And I think that, you know, as a whole board, you know, it comes down, you know, economy, a scale too. I mean, there's only so many practitioners that we can have accessible. Um, you know, I think it's a great and the right conversation to make sure that medical attention is available and accessible. Hey, Brett. I can find that out. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, I switched to my phone. So so I have a, I have a, I have a question regarding um, the element of the contract from a, a compensation or money perspective. Is it a flat rate that we're contracting with, with this organization? No. And, and if so, is that impacted at all by what sports we actually run because we're not sure at this point if we're going to have football or if we're going to have soccer or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, how we use this organization is going to be, I think, somewhat fluid until we really understand, you know, how we're going to be coming back and what sports we're going to be allowed to, to actually participate in. It did, Damon, towards the end of the contract, it had an hourly rate attachment, that I think attachment we agreed to pay. Attachment okay. C, it's twenty eight seventy eight per hour. So why don't you let Matt, Matt, Matt take a little bit of time to explain how the contract is being used. So if we don't use it, you know, is that money that we have to pay? So Matt can explain. Are we tied okay. to these particular games? Or is there room to say, well, we've decided, you know, it says select. Well, I don't know what that means, selected. Um, I'm just curious how tight this is. Yeah, in terms of th that, well, I'll just talk about the hourly first. The hourly rate in attachment C um, is twenty eight seventy eight per hour for services provided. So that's the compensation base as a whole there, um, and it can vary throughout the year. You know, it it all depends on the services being provided, and then if there's sectionals and so forth on those different pieces. Um, I'd we'd really have to touch base with Fritz to determine whether or not he's ever veered off of this. I would I would say that if it's sports not identified in the contract, there may need to be a revision to the contract itself, um, especially because of liability purposes and all of those pieces. If it's not identified, so um, I would I would say that piece would need to be reviewed with Fritz, the athletic director. Oh, and just one other tiny question. It it says football games, but I assume that 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 they're actually covering the cheerleaders for injuries as well, right? Of course. If anybody gets hurt, somebody in the stands gets hurt, um, if they're just at that football game, not necessarily you know, solely focused. I, I've been in games where fans have had seizures and the trainer, Cheryl, and, you know, wonderfully went up 
Thank you. I'm, I'm a little, there are a couple that, that stick out to me, like home junior varsity football games, selected away games. Why aren't we just sending all the games? It becomes, yeah, it it becomes I mean, about economics. Like, like you said, Jody, Judy, if it's, it's, you know, wrestling as requested. I mean, my one son was in wrestling, and, and let me tell you, we needed a trainer at every every meet and every match because you know, it's, it's brute force, and there's a potential for some significant injury there. You know, again, selected away I, games. I, I think if, if we wanted to expand this contract and have more um, opportunities for trainers at hand, I think that would be welcome. It's, it, again, it's just, this is about managing the budget as well, trying to find a balance. Right. And, and again, also, when there are away games or games that are not covered by our trainer, I know that there's communication and standards and procedures in place. I, I just they, I think it has, we, there has to be a gender might, equity as well. We yeah. can't be sending them for male teams and not female teams. Right. And I'm seeing, I'm wondering about somebody just mentioned cheerleading. At the football game, that's fine, but they're the high risk, they're <coughs> at high risk level when they're in competition. That's when they need somebody. I don't know how mm -hmm. much that gets handled. I just think also we're a little bit premature, I think. I mean, I, I really. I know that we haven't really talked about this, but I really, really feel like there's going to be some sports that are just not happening in the fall. <laughs> and we may be able to use the, the, this, these trainers at other events that we do have happening. But I, I mean, given what I'm hearing um, about a professional level and college level, I think that some of the sports are going to be at, at significant risk of just not, not occurring. So, yeah, the state has given us the low, medium, high risk teams sports so we have a, a window into what may be happening uh, I, and I, I, have a, sports, yeah. I have a concern too that we only have boys and girls varsity soccer not JV I, I'm, I'm very concerned for our modified kids who, who is responsible for making sure our modified kids get the attention they need should they get injured and our modified kids skills are still in the developmental stage so they're not going to be as skilled as, as some of these uh, older kids. And they start their, their seasons once school starts, where the, the varsity and JV, they start well in advance of a season. I, that, 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 I'm concerned about that. So I, again, I'd be happy to continue to develop this conversation. And I think it's the right conversation to make sure our kids uh, at all levels, in all areas, all sports, um, are properly, appropriately um, supported medically and, um, and how do we assign them. I, I took a bunch of notes. That's what I was doing here, writing it down. So I, I, I think it's a, the right conversation. And then the board can decide, you know, if, if more resources need to be applied to it, you know, we could talk about that just to make sure our kids are safe and you feel comfortable with that. Um, I do feel that, again, this is not – this is on an hourly basis, so if the hours are not used to, I think, Mr. Buffum's question, in let's just say half of the sport teams are um, are canceled for COVID purposes, we not, we're not paying that dollar amount. Right. So this is this is an, an as needed. And how it put together and what leeway there is, I'd sort of like to wait on this till we have more information. I don't know how anyone else feels. Matt question for you how 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 did you arrive at the dollar amount that you included in the budget uh, Fritz gives me an estimate of hours and we've just continued that estimate over the past okay, couple of so years so you yep. used like you know 1400 hours or whatever yep. the number is multiplied by the 2878 there's our dollar correct okay so we have um, July 7th um, we have we have approved this in, at the reorg meeting as well right so um, you know, I don't have a problem pulling it off, getting a comprehensive reflection and report, if that's the board's interest. I, again, I, I, I think it's a, a worthy, reflective um, exercise. When do we have to have this contract signed? Is July, there a July set 1st. date that, that uh, the U of R needs this? July 1st. It's all retroactive. So July 1st is, is July 1st. when okay. the new year comes. That's why I think, like, Mike, uh, Matt likes to get it in this contract, I mean, in this 
meeting because it sure. will be for services rendered. But um, you know, I know we put it in the other one as well. I mean, the, the term says it starts August first, so we need to have it signed by yeah, July. August first. Oh, 1st. oh. Yeah, I see. August is it? The, it starts August first. My fault. My fault. Yep. Excuse me. Yep. So, so we don't have any coverage in July, assuming there's no athletics in July. We don't have athletics athletics in dry, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So we've got some time. Matt, can I ask you a question? Do we normally stay with well within the budget that you set up? Yeah, we do. We do. And do they do they uh, bill us on a uh, monthly basis? Oh, off the top of my head, I, I don't know the billing um, process. Usually it's approved by the athletic director and goes to our accounts payable group. I believe it is. That. It probably says right in the agreement. I'm sure it does. I think it, it does. Again. Yeah, as a one and a half percent penalty for not paying on time. Yeah, month, and monthly. It's a so monthly. Other than games, we have one trainer here for while all the kids are practicing. Is that right? I, I believe the the U of R assigns us a trainer. I know Cheryl, and you see her in her cart, and yeah. she's all over the place. Whether she's taping ankles or attending to a game or somebody who fell in the stands. I, I've seen it all. And um, yes, yeah, so yeah. she's um, she's our wonder person. She's so this taped up several of my children, which I very much <laughs> <appreciate>. <laughs> um, But that is a large number of, of athletes for one person. Yeah, I think it's like I'm saying, it's a great reflective exercise and a needs assessment. And uh, I think it's one of those things that have, you know, it's always been monitored and there's been guardrails around it. And I, I welcome this um, as, a, as a dad who has athletes and I've ha had the same thoughts and feelings. Um, and you wonder how that one person can do that job. Um, so I, I, I think it's a wonderful reflective exercise. Brad, right? can I ask you a question? These, all these sports that are listed here so far, are they all practicing at, on the high school grounds or some at the Minerva grounds and some at other grounds? It depends on field utilization, sometimes weather permitting so, as well. So that trainer so that trainer will have to travel not just from sport to sport, but from location to location possibly. Uh, it, 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 becomes, it becomes an exercise, and again, there's only one person, one resource, so you try to right. put that person where the most um, concentration, um, bang for your buck, if you will, occurs. And, and usually that's the high school. Discussions we need to have this thing that's usually well. at the high school, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, because, yeah. A lot of concerns in my head. And billing is monthly. I don't know if I'd, everyone caught that. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So officially, we will need a, ta a motion to table. That will take priority over the motion to approve. So, Judy, motion to table. A second? A second. Tim, second. Any discussions about that motion? Um, will we then come back to this, like Brett said, at the July 7th meeting, or... That would be our next be opportunity. It has to be. It has to be at one of the July meetings. Yes. There's only one. There's only. That's the only meeting. So, so what would happen is I would make a recommendation that I'll get a report from the athletic director. I try to get as many of these questions down. Um, I'll share the information as part of information sharing, and um, I, I, July seventh, um, that will be an opportunity to bring it forward because we don't have anything until um, what I would see August tenth would be our next meeting. Um, don't we have a workshop in July? That's August 10th. Nope. No, no workshop. No workshop in July. We've not typically we had a workshop. We have the one meeting then. We, yes. we could. I mean, we could do it July. Okay. okay. So uh, mo or the motion's been made. Uh, all those in favor of tabling this approval? Aye. Aye. All, uh, any opposed? Aye. Or abstentions? 7-0 then, hearing and seeing none. Um, approval though, the VOCES final service contract for the 2020-2021 school year. Moved. Joyce, thank you. Second, second, Tim. Tim. Thank you, Tim. Questions about this contract? It's quite extensive. $13.5 million. Um, very inclusive. Out of this, this is one, if we don't use somehow this is, is this where we get refunds from if we don't use all of them, right? So this is where BOCES will send us back refunds if we don't use it, the full 13 and a half million. And they've been fairly sizable in the past, right? Yep. Multiple th hundreds of thousands of dollars refunds. Um, 
so again, it's a contract where if we don't use it, we don't lose it. We get the we get the money back. Right. Other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none. Seven zero. So this we talked about before, or had a notice on in terms of creating the workers' compensation reserve. So this is a reserve that does not exist at the time, but we'd like to create it. I'll make the motion to create this reserve, or yes, approve the creation. If you need a second. Second, Marty. Marty, thank you. Do you have questions, comments about the workers' comp reserve? Makes good sense. Yes. Um, very good. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none. 7 0. Very good. Then the school food service budget for the next school year. Motion to approve that budget. Judy, first. Thank you. Second, Marty. Questions or comments? I believe this was. Um, go ahead. I just had a question because we had talked at some point about looking at, you know, not using the styrofoam trays, looking at some more environmentally friendly options. Are any of those reflected in the budget? Um, truthfully, our audit um, was interrupted by COVID-19 and we were supposed to, remember we had a whole plan to bring that environmental audit through the Board of Education um, to talk about conservation and where we can continue to improve so unfortunately that is not reflected because um, because the process we had we didn't we didn't finalize that but we will be picking that up um, for the fall if, if you notice if you notice Judy on the uh, on the document there was a three hundred thirty seven thousand dollar loss this year and that's simply because mm -hmm. nobody was buying lunch yet we were providing lunches for those students who uh, who deserve a free lunch or free breakfast. So right there, almost half of the half of the account was, was used and it's gonna take some time to get that back up. If you notice also that, and then Michelle explained this to us at our, our audit finance meeting, that the price of lunches for the next school year is not going to increase. It could be, those costs will remain the same for the students. Yeah, I just, I wonder, because we haven't really even gotten to the point for the low-hanging fruit, how much would it be, what would be the price differential from using styrofoam, which we can't recycle, to using something either that we can recycle or, um, so. And unfortunately, if you notice, because of the, the COVID situation, we're using more single-use serving mm -hmm. items because of the, the potential for spreading that disease where we all know that if you use soap and water on it, any type of object that cleans the virus away. But the plastic bag ban is not being enforced currently right now. People are using plastic bags still and until we kind of, you know, and, and I had the same question, like, you know, when are we gonna do that then? Or are we gonna do that? So I, I don't have that answer immediately because of where we've been the past several months. So, um, you know, we were on that track and there were, there was a plan to bring our, um, I'm forgetting the name of the group here, Impact Earth to Fairport to talk about some of their mm -hmm. ideas. We will continue to reboot, or we will reboot that conversation. Um, they did a waste study, and um, I know that they were also affected by COVID as well. So, um, um, you know, so thank you for asking, and I know that it's on your mind. I know it's on our community's mind too. It's just it was interrupted, the pace and the timeline it back to the parking lot list for workshops and topics that we had it before I marked it as done it still was on there but I marked it as done so I don't see it but now it's added again so we can remember it for the future while we're at a, a garbage waste and contract may I ask a question here of course Matt do we have a set amount that we pay for our refuse collection because uh, obviously with students out of the buildings for the past three months, our, our refuse has significantly dec declined. Yep, it's based on container pickup. So we would revise, and I know Aaron uh, worked closely to revise actually the pit number of pickups 
that we would have since we've been out okay. because we're just not generating the amount of refuse as before. Right. So, okay. yeah, it's based on container pickup. Comparatively, I'd be next to nothing. Okay. Any other questions, specifics, especially the food service budget? No other comments? All in favor of the budget? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none. 7 0. The control cycle internal audit report, motion to approve. I know it's exciting, people. So moved, Marty. Okay. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> Second, Judy. Um, any comments? I don't know anybody from the Audit Finance Committee who saw this or other questions for them? Uh, I think for the policy committee, there were two policies that they pointed out in this audit that I think we need to look at. All right. Make sure we look at those. And the question of whether we want to go deeper in terms of a next step into what was it penetration testing they they say right whether we actually want to go into having efforts made right the ethical hacks type activity to see how vulnerable we might really be um, that's not for tonight necessarily but that's indeed uh, something to consider and while thinking of it add it to a workshop topic yeah, workshops getting longer and longer yeah okay not not hearing any questions then all in favor aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed hearing and seeing none then that has been approved our claims audit report which we do see from time to time but this covers the month we didn't do the january February, march i thought we did those already Okay, January through April. Um, motion to approve the claims auditor reports. So moved. Kevin, thank you. Second, Marty. Second, Marty, thank you. Questions? Very standard findings, I believe, overall. Mm -hmm. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, 7 0. 8K, 2019-2020 year end fund balance analysis and use of reserves. Uh, somewhat dependent on right actual final numbers, but uh, as outlined there, need a motion to approve. Move, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Second, Judy. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Very good. If we approve this, that's how they'll be allocated based on final numbers all in favor aye. aye aye any opposed hearing and seeing none seven zero. and finally internal audit risk assessment did i confuse the two um motion that the need a motion that or make the motion the board accept the internal audit risk assessment this need a second second marty thank you marty questions or comments about this all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 7-0. And final, budget transfers as outlined. Uh, motion to approve budget transfers at end of year. So, so moved. moved. Okay, Kevin first, Tim second. Yes. Thank you. Questions or comments about the budget transfers recommended? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none. Seven zero. Whew! That was quite a list of action items. Um, so this is time. We are at the end of the agenda, um, but again, end of our school year as well. Our last meeting of this school year. Kevin, last for you as well. Any uh, comments from any board members? Or are we ready to be done for the night? I'd like to uh, just say thank you for making my first year on the board. That's me. I think I came in with a little bit of background knowledge that helped <laughs> it along. And Kevin, I want to thank you for uh, working with you for the past year. It's been uh, very enjoyable and educational. You have added a lot to the district, and I've heard that from the teachers I've worked with, and I've seen it firsthand for the last two years of my teaching career. So thank you. Thank you. Your sense of humor, Kevin. <laughs> I appreciated it a lot. <laughs> Always useful. We'll miss you greatly, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, very much Thanks, so. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Mr. Glover, Thank you'll be missed. It's an honor to be on the board. And uh, 
it's great to be part of uh, this district with uh, great students, staff, administrators, and the board. So just a, a great community. We are lucky, you're right. Thank you for everything, yeah, Kevin. We're very fortunate. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have been uh, able to serve on the board for the last three years. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that Thank service. You. Anyone else? Then I, I will make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Kevin. Your last motion there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I still abstain. <laughs> right, yes. I keep watching his screen, see if he gives a thumbs down or something. But anyway, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed or abstentions? I abstain. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. The, the, the perpetual meeting he's voting you have for. have to state right? your reason. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't want to go. With uh, his, just to be obnoxious. Yep, yeah, with his last <laughs> sense of humor. That counts. That counts. Looks like 7 0 with the last sense of humor. Thank you, everybody, and have a great night, great summer. Have a great night. Thank you. Everybody be Thank safe. You. Good night. Everybody. Thank you.